Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. Creating the conditions for a miracle. And with this teaching tonight, it's going to be a teaching where we're going to believe God for some miracles here tonight. Amen? We're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to take over the atmosphere in this building and in this place and in the hearts of, of all of you here tonight. If you are open and ready, we're going to believe God to do some miracles. But at the same time, I want you to take some notes of what I share tonight. Because when you are believing God out there in the world and you need a miracle from God, I want you to go through a checklist. Because these four things I'm going to give you are just foundational. You see, some people think that Getting a miracle from God is kind of like, you know, going to Vegas and hitting the, the slot machine. And just, you know, you just if you put, pull it in the right time, you know, it's your time and your number comes up and you're going to win the lottery or you're going to hit the jackpot. And people have that mentality that somehow there's sort of a random thing that God, you know, sometimes just chooses to do a miracle. It's sort of a random act of God. But, you know, there are people that live in the miraculous. There are people that see miracles every day. And I believe that if you create the right conditions for a miracle, that God has a much easier time getting that miracle into your life. So I'm just going to give you these four things. And two of them were actually covered by Pastor Jim last Sunday, were, were touched on uh, in his message. Because the very first one is what I would call expectancy. I'm expecting a miracle. Now, I'm going to differentiate because most of what Pastor Jim talked about was hope. There is a difference in the definition between expectancy and hope. Hope is that you expect God will do something, and that's important. But expectancy is a state of disposition. It's a state where you are expecting it to happen any moment. You are in a ready state, in a ready condition, and there is a sense of expectancy that it could happen at any moment. And the Bible says we need to have an expectancy. When we're believing God for a miracle, you know, there's a story in the Bible about um, Martha and Mary when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and Jesus came into Judea. And the two sisters of Lazarus, whose brother had died, and they came running to Jesus and, and, and Martha came to Jesus and said these words, said, you know, Jesus, if you had been here, my, my brother would not have died. You see, she had faith that if Jesus had been there before when he was alive, that, the, that, they, you know, that her brother would not have had to die. He would have been healed before. She had faith for the past. Then Jesus said, your brother will rise again. This is in John 11. Now, she said, yes, Lord, I know he'll rise at the last day. She had faith for the future. You know, sometime way in the future, he's going to rise again. I know he's going to come back. And then Jesus said these words, I am the resurrection and the life. You see, Jesus wants our faith to be now. You can have faith for the past. If he had only been here, or you have faith for the future, well, in the last day, everything's going to be great. But Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. I want you to believe and expect a miracle now. Amen? I want us to start in Mark chapter 5. But the woman who had an issue of blood... In verse 25, we pick up the story of this massive crowd of people. This woman's not supposed to be in a crowd, but she breaks through the crowd. And all she wants to do is touch Jesus. In verse 25, it says this in Mark chapter 5. Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years, had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said... If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. I want you just to catch the heart of this woman that she, she believed the moment I touch him, I'm going to be healed. There was an incredible expectancy of a miracle that she said that that point of contact, that point of that moment I touch him, we need to have that. If you want to receive a miracle from God, you need to expect it. 
Not at some distant time in the future. But you know, miracles will get birthed right into your spirit, right in, 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 a, in, a, in a service like tonight. You can receive a miracle. Amen? Amen? Mark chapter 10, a few chapters later, there's a man by the name of blind Bartimaeus, and Bartimaeus is totally blind. This is a fascinating story. In Mark chapter 10, verse 46, it says, Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? Now, isn't that a strange question? The guy's blind, he's crying, Son of David, have mercy on me. But you know what? Sometimes Jesus wants you to articulate your faith. And you know, he could have said, well, Jesus, I just want a nice new cane that I can just find my way around. Or Lord, I would just love to have a guide dog to carry me along, to lead me. Or a person who would be my friend who would come and, and, and guide me through my life. You see... God's going to ask you, what are you believing me for? What is your faith being put out for? And you may think that everybody, you know, is expecting for a miracle. But you know what? Some people, you know, their faith's just not there. I had a friend in high school, and, and he was my, one of my closest friends. His name was Peter Filmer. You know, we, we, we were graduating high school. I actually did an extra year, and he had gone on, and he was you know, getting ready that he had to go to the military. We had mandatory conscription in South Africa where I grew up. And the reason I left South Africa was I, I would not go and fight for the apartheid system. But my friend, you know, he didn't want to go either, but he ended up coming down with a disease called Mycenae Gravis. It's, it affects the eyelids and you cannot, you cannot open your eyelids. And he was, he was very sick with this, this disease. And at that time, I was just growing in my faith, and I heard that there was a family that, that were used by God in miracles and healing. And I just got my friend, and I said, listen, we're going to go there, and we're going to pray for you. We're going to believe God. And I, I dragged this guy. I don't even know if he was saved. I don't even think he was. But I just said, you know, we're going to go, and we're going to have you, we're gonna have you prayed for. And I got him to this Bible study, and we gathered around him, and we, we were about to start praying for him. And he looked up, and he says, I, I don't want to get healed. He says, this is my ticket out of the army. He didn't want a miracle. He wasn't, he wasn't open for one. And many, many times, Jesus will say to you, what are you trusting me for? Where is your faith at? What are you expecting me to do? Because he'll meet you at your point of faith. Amen? It says, the blind man said, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said, go your way, your faith has made you well. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. So your expectancy and believing that God wants to do it and do it now. Now I believe in the concept that God births things in your spirit. Even miracles are birthed at a moment of time. You may have an outworking of a miracle. Many times Reinhard Bonka, I used to work for him for three and a half years, travel the world, and he would pray for people who couldn't get pregnant. But you know, many dozens and dozens of times we saw that nine months to the day after he prayed, people had children. To the day. And they, some of them had been barren for years and years. And so, you know, that miracle was birthed in them at that moment. It took nine months to manifest, or at least three. But, you know... It has to start when you allow that miracle, that expectancy in you to receive. Amen? Amen? So number one is expectancy. Number two is dependency. Dependency is critical. Pastor Jim talked about dependency and trust. And this message really came out of 
a study on weakness. God began to show me that, you know, we, we have an image of, of a macho person, what they can do, and that, you know, you want to be strong for God. And we have this sort of idea of being physically fit and mentally and spiritually and, you know, sort of that, that, that amazing, the natural world's idea of what God would use in a person. But you know what? The more of you that's involved in anything that you do for God, the less of God is involved. And the greatest miracles that God will do will come out of your weakness. And that's why the Bible said, let the weak say, I'm strong. And this scripture that, 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 that the Apostle Paul wrote about weakness, and I want to read it to you. And when I talk about weakness, I'm talking about a total dependency because you either are self-sufficient or you are God-dependent. And you've got to decide which one of those you want to be. And sometimes we like to be self-sufficient because, you know, it feels like we're in control. But when you're totally God-dependent, that's when God can really move. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll put it up on the screens. The Apostle Paul is actually having a messenger of Satan buffeting him. The Bible says it was, it was the enemy, and it was because of all the revelations that he had. And this is what it says, and, and he, he, he asked the Lord a number of times, and it says that God responded this. He said, God, please take this away. Take this buffeting, this, this messenger of Satan buffeting me. In verse 9 it says, And he, God, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, this is a really difficult concept to grasp. But I often say to Pastor Jim, if you're praying to God to do something, if there's a thousand ways you can think of the way that God should answer it, God will choose the thousand and one way that you didn't think. So I just try not to think too many because I want to give them lots of options. <laughs> Amen? Because... Whenever we try and figure God out, or whenever we try and say, God, you should do it like this, you should answer it like that, or this is what I want, and this is how I want you to do it, he doesn't get much glory when you try and manipulate the system. When Gideon was going with a huge army to go and fight the enemy, God said, there's too many people. And what do you mean? He says, God, they got that many, and I'm going to got this many. He said, cut it down. He cut it down to 10,000 people. God said, too many. He ended up with 300 against tens of thousands of, of the enemy. And God said, okay, now 300, that's good. Now you can go. You know, because God knew if it was any more, man would try and take the glory. Let me tell you, out of weakness, there's strength. When you're at the place where you're at your end, that's a good place. That's when you turn it over to God. That's when you say, God, I can't do it alone. I need your help. That dependency upon God is so critical. And whatever you do, make sure you don't get in God's way and you don't try and take some of His glory and you don't take, take some of the credit because when you're in a place of total dependency upon Him, that's when you're strong. That's when God's power can rest upon you. That's when God's anointing can flow through you. That's the greatest place of God's anointing and God's grace in your life. Amen? Amen? I want to take this one step further. I want us to look at the cross. God was working in the cross the greatest miracle that ever, ever took place on the whole earth. It was the salvation of every human being, every human life, it was the place of the healing of the human race. It was the place where God had to manifest the greatest miracle that was ever, ever performed on the earth. It was the salvation of the whole planet. 
But in order to manifest that miracle in Jesus, God had to bring Jesus to the place of greatest weakness, place of greatest shame, place of greatest humility, and the place of, of greatest pain. And only in that place, and I want you to imagine that after the, the, the beating across his back with hundreds of whips that, that, that lacerated his back, we, many of us saw the passion of the Christ, and how they made him carry his cross up to Golgotha. Simon of Cyrene helped him as he got to the end of that because he couldn't have enough strength to even make it. And they had mocked him and ripped his beard. They had taken a crown of thorns and they had beaten it with rods into his head. An entire garrison had abused him and had, had just beat him until he was almost unconscious. And then they dragged him up Golgotha. And they took his hands and his feet and they, they put him in a position where he cannot move, where he can hardly breathe. And they nailed his hands and his feet, stripped him naked, threw lots for his clothing. And they lifted him up between heaven and earth and dropped him into the ground. His bones sticking out and just, you know, absolutely a, 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 a beaten, bloody mess hanging there on the cross between heaven and earth. And I want us to look into the mind of Jesus because we all know of Psalm 23, which is the Lord is my shepherd. But many of us don't know Psalm 22 written a thousand years before Jesus went through the cross. And it's a soliloquy of what Jesus was going through his mind as he hung there. We're going to pick it up on, on verse 1, which is the last words of Jesus on the cross. One of the last seven words, he, Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And now we're going to get it, and you're going to see as we read this that there's no question this was him looking down at the cross and this is what's going through his heart. That's exactly what is going through his mind prophetically of what Jesus encountered. And I want you to look for the word trust. I want you to look for the word dependence. The dependency that Jesus had on the Father as God is working the greatest miracle in the universe, Jesus is at the place of greatest dependency, of greatest weakness. And this is what it says. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my groaning. In verse 4, our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and they were delivered. They trusted in you and they were not ashamed. He's going back to the history of his nation. And then verse 7, all those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip, they shake their head saying he trusted in the Lord. Let him, God, rescue him. Let God deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while I was on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Now listen to these words. I am poured out like water, in verse 14. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue clings to my jaws and you have brought me to the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me and deliver me from the sword. In verse 21, you've answered me. All the ends of the earth of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations, including those in San Bernardino, shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. Yeah. Amen. 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 You often think you've got to be, you know, you think Jesus would ride it on his horse with a great miracle. The greatest miracle was at the place of greatest dependency the place of greatest weakness. And when you are weak and you are strong, when you are totally dependent upon God, when you've reached the end of your bank account, that's when God can manifest His power. When you've reached the end of your strength and you, the doctors have reached the end of their rope, then that's when God can come through and that's when God can heal you and that's when God can show His power. When everybody else can say no, God says yes. 
That's what you have to believe. Don't be worried that you're at the end. In your weakness, you are strong. In your dependency upon God, you expect Him and you depend upon Him. You're creating the conditions for a miracle. Are you with me, church? Yes. Number three is what I call occupancy. Occupancy is an interesting concept because it's... I'm, when I talk about occupancy, I'm talking about who's occupying, who's occupying the atmosphere. Who's occupying the environment. Who's, what is occupying the environment? Many years ago, a, a couple came from the East Coast and they actually, we got to meet with Pastor Jim and, and, and a number of other people. And we, we, you know, we had some days with these people together and, and this, the wife said something which has stuck with me ever since. She was speaking about the creation of the earth, that when God made, you know, the earth, he spent six days creating environment. And then on the, no, in five days creating the environment, on the sixth day, he put man into the environment. You see, God creates environment, and then he puts man into the environment, and into that environment, then man can flourish. If you work on creating an environment of, of the atmosphere of God, then God can work miracles in that environment. So it's important that we dominate the environment. Now I'm just going to start with just giving you two quick examples here. Number one, we come in here and praise and worship. The reason we come into the presence of God, the reason why you can receive a miracle more where you are right now in church is because we have ushered in His presence. The Bible says God inhabits the praises of His people. And when we are worshiping, at the end of worship, it's sometimes you just want to linger there. Because you can just feel the presence. You can feel the atmosphere of heaven. You can feel God. It's an intangible. You can't, just, you can't you know, easily you know, define it. But it's there. And those who, who come and they just sense that presence, they just want to just, just keep playing that, 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 that you know, instrument just a little longer. I just want to just drink in. I can feel the presence of God. In the atmosphere of God, God can perform miracles. Are you with me? So, we need to create the atmosphere. The Bible talks about the prophet Elijah, that he came and, and, he, and, and, the, and the kings were wanting him to prophesy. And he turned and he said, he said, bring a minstrel. And this you can find in it's just it's one little short scripture. In 2 Kings 3, 15, prophet Elijah said, but now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. It's interesting that he couldn't just... He couldn't just prophesy. He had to bring in the atmosphere. He had to begin to worship. He had to bring in a minstrel, begin to bring that atmosphere of worship and praise. And into that atmosphere came the presence of God. Now the Holy Spirit began to move. And then the miraculous came. And then the power of the prophetic word was able to come forth. Now we have to be much more conscious of atmosphere and the environment than we've ever been before. Amen? We need to create an environment of praise and worship. Sometimes you just need to put music on in your home. You just need to, you know, instead of listening to whatever news station or whatever sports station or whatever, you need to just, you know, fill the atmosphere with worship, with praise, with the Word of God. Are you with me? So an atmosphere of praise and worship is one. An atmosphere of faith is number two. And I'm not going to give you all of the ones I have, but I'm just going to give you a handful. It's interesting, in this first story we read about the woman with the issue of blood that came, Jesus who actually was healed, this woman touched her and she was healed. He didn't even try and do that. She's the one who pulled that miracle out of him. Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? They said, everybody's touching you. He said, yeah, somebody touched me with expectancy. Somebody touched me with faith. Somebody touched me and, my, and power went out of my body. You see, you can put a demand and receive because power will flow out from God into your life. When you put a demand on it, when you expect it and put faith and activate it. Right after that, the Bible says that Jesus went to, to a person's house. He was Jarius and his daughter had died. They didn't know at that time. They actually came running and said, no, don't come, Jesus. You know, the daughter's dead. 
forget about it, you know, it's too late, you know. And Jesus, the Bible says, I want you just to, look, to, to just look at the scripture. Mark chapter 5. So we're picking it up right after he, she, he healed the woman with the issue of blood. In verse 35, while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. He permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead but sleeping. But they ridiculed him and they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. He took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumai, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age. Now, it's interesting, immediately that that word, that bad news came, Jesus said, don't only believe. He immediately spoke that word of faith. Immediately said, don't listen to that. Don't listen to that report. Only believe. Amen? And then the Bible says he didn't take all of his disciples. He chose three that he knew were in faith with him. He put everybody and says, you stay behind. We're going together. When he got there, they're all wailing and weeping. He spoke the word of faith. They all ridiculed him. He didn't care. And then the Bible says he cleared the atmosphere. He cleared the room. He took the father and mother and the three disciples. He took everybody else and he put them out. You don't want anybody to contaminate the atmosphere. Amen? And then he spoke the word of faith. And the miracle happened. You've got to protect the atmosphere of faith. Don't let, the, don't let people who, who don't believe and just, when those things happen, you say, listen, please, you know, I'm going to believe what God says. And I'm going to, and you can't always be perfect at this, but let me tell you, Jesus himself had people speak things, and he just continued to speak back what God says. Amen? So let's control the environment of faith. An environment of praise and worship, an environment of faith. I'm just going to give you a few other ones. An environment of gratitude. We have seven prayer meetings in our office a week. Every single morning from 8.30 to 9, and then from 4.30 to 5 on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the afternoon. We, we, we gather, and the first thing we do is pray. It's not just about us, you know, I pay my people to pray. Some of you who, you know, would love your bosses to pay, pay for you to pray. I tell my guys, you're on the clock. I am paying you now to engage God. And the reason I have those seven prayer meetings a week and the reason why the beginning of every day, half an hour, is spent in prayer is I'm interested in the atmosphere of my office. I'm interested in controlling it. I'm interested in bringing into that atmosphere the presence of God. And it's so important that, that we are consciously believing God for His presence, believing God for that atmosphere to come in. And often we start, because the Bible says you enter His courts with thanksgiving. His gates with thanksgiving, His courts with praise. You enter His gates with thanksgiving. Sometimes the first 10 or 15 minutes we just say, I will go around the room, everybody thank God for something, thank God for something. Come into, have an attitude of thanksgiving. Lisa told me the story about Corrie Ten Boom, about how she was interned in a, in, a, in a German concentration camp during the Second World War. She had a sister who was more godly than Corrie. And her sister would just always be thanking God, always thanking God. And, and you know, they had a situation where all of the barracks got infested with bedbugs. And the sister of Corrie said, Corrie, thank God for the bedbugs. Thank God for the bedbugs. She said, are you crazy? We're being bitten all over. I said, Corey, just keep thanking God for the bedbugs. You know, after the war, her sister died in the, in, the, in the camp. After the war, though, as she became very famous, she was touring around and she was speaking, and a, one of the guards that was in that camp came up and had become a believer. And he said, you know, Corey, the reason we didn't go into that barrack and rape all the women is because of the bedbugs. Amen? 
We don't necessarily thank God for all things, but we thank God in all things. Amen? We need to have an attitude of gratitude, an environment of grace and forgiveness. We'll talk about things that contaminate, but grace and forgiveness is critical that there's forgiveness in your atmosphere and, and an environment of truthfulness, integrity, and honesty. I'm going to give you two more, and there's a bunch of others, but I'm just going to give you two more. An environment of affirmation and encouragement and an environment where people feel genuinely loved and cared for. I don't allow in my family for my kids to call each other names, derogatory names. Endearing names, I'm no problem, but in derogatory names. I don't allow them to say, you idiot, you fool, you this, you that. I don't, I don't allow that, those words because I don't want to contaminate my atmosphere. I don't want to contaminate. I won't allow Lisa and I, we, we, from the beginning of our marriage, one of those principles where we never go to sleep if we have an unresolved argument. We've been up at about 4 o'clock in the morning sometimes. I'm like, I'm not going to bed until this is resolved. But it's just a principle on that because it's not just because that I'm right or she's wrong or whatever. It's a case of the atmosphere in our home. We don't want to, we don't want to destroy that. Let me just give you a few things that contaminate the atmosphere. Envy and self-seeking. Wrong motivations. Pride. Unrighteousness. Oppression. Intimidation. Prejudice. Greed. Strife. Gossip. Hypocrisy. Control. Manipulation. Misuse of power. Fear and insecurity. People not knowing where they stand. Mistrust. Deception and deceit. Partiality. Unjustness, unfairness, and an unjust scale. That's a very quick list. I don't want to take too much time, more time, but these things contaminate. People wonder, why don't I get a miracle? Why don't I have a miracle? Because you know what? The whole atmosphere is so full of poison, so full of other stuff that's going on. And not that you're going to get rid of it, all of it, but you know what? When you become aware of it, now I worked for Reinhard Bonke, and he had... A, a man in his, who, who through his ministry or when he was ministering, he, this guy was downstairs. His wife had brought a coffin, three days dead in a coffin in Nigeria. I happened to know the pastor of the church. I know the church where it happened. We used to have a, an apartment on the complex of the pastor's house. And I've heard the story from Reinhardt and I, I know the people that documented it. So it is a true story. Three days dead. And while he was preaching upstairs, a, a crowd gathered and they began to massage that body. They had already put formaldehyde into the veins. And God brought that man back to life. It was a pastor. It was the mother, I'm sorry, the wife, who refused to give up and believe God for that miracle. As they worshipped and worshipped, took about five hours before that man came back. So when I was in Australia a few years ago, I had lunch with Reinhardt. And I said, well, I want to hear more about this story. And he said, he says, that guy now lives, he had to move out of Nigeria, he lives down in East London in South Africa. And he, he said for three months after this miracle, as he, every time he sweated, this formaldehyde would come out of his body. But he said, made an interesting comment. He said, the man is so sensitive to any kind of strife. He cannot be around strife. He's so sensitive. He had this encounter where he saw God, saw Jesus at, and, 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 and God brought him back after three days. Amazing man. But let me tell you, he has been in the presence of God and he could not handle any type of strife. The pastor that, 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 that mentored me in my first came to America in 1980, you know, he has, had personally seen the Lord eight times. He was a very godly man, one of the godliest men. He's gone to be with the Lord now. And I, I, I was curious about, you know, when you saw Jesus, what, what, what was it like? Was it, you know, does he, his glory, his power, did you feel, you know, what, what was the feeling? And you know what the greatest thing that struck him when he had an encounter with Jesus? Was his meekness. It was his humility. He said when he looked into the eyes of Jesus, he says the inside of him was turned into corruption because he realized how much pride he had in his heart. He said the look of Jesus was utter meekness. When we understand that the way up to God is down, 
But God operates through humility. He operates through meekness. He operates through the foolish things of the world. You want to see a miracle from God, we have to come onto His terms. And we've got to create an environment where He can move. Are you with me, church? Amen. We're coming to a close. Is anybody getting any help tonight? Amen. Can you take one last point? This is the last one. We've looked at your expectation, your dependency, the environment or the occupancy, what's occupying the space. But at the end of the day, you've got to be gutsy. That's my last point. Being gutsy for God. The Bible says we need to come boldly. We come to a throne of grace. We don't deserve anything anyway. All right? You don't earn a miracle. You can't get a miracle because somehow you're good enough to get one. Nobody's good enough to get one. Amen? It's all His grace. It's all what Jesus did on that cross. If you think that you can better what He did when He died and He hung there, and you think that somehow you are worthy enough, you've got a second thing coming to you because it's not going to work. He did it all. The only way we get a miracle from God is by trusting and believing and obeying. Amen? And so, the Bible says we need to come boldly. He, he wants to do a miracle. Now, many times, you know, when we look at God, we're like, you know, we're just asking Him to do small stuff. Somehow, I think when we get to heaven, we're going to be like, oh, God, I could have asked you for a lot more than this. <laughs> About 10 days ago, I, I, I ended up joining some friends from South Africa and we, some people I'd been in high school with, and we played golf in, a, in Augusta, Georgia. It wasn't at the Augusta, Georgia. It was another course. But it was a course that was designed by somebody called Arnold Palmer. Anybody ever heard of an Arnold Palmer? Not the drink, the guy, all right? The golfer. <laughs> And Arnold Palmer, one of my staff, heard this on the radio about how he had been invited by a sheik in the Middle East to go and, you know, help him with his golf game. And his, he had a course that he had built. These sheiks have enough money. They have their own course, their own everything. He flew over on his private plane and landed there in the Middle East. And he helped this guy for about a week and stayed at his home. And it was a palatial place. And... And at the end of this week, he helped this guy with his swing and his course and all the management and everything else. And, and as he was flying back to America, the sheik came to him and said, you know what? He said, Arnold, I just have such a sense of, ingrat of gratitude to you. And, it, and, and it, I feel just a debt of, of gratitude that I need to do something for you. He said, How, what can I give you? What do you need or what do you, what do you want? Arnold Palmer says, well, I'm independently wealthy. I don't, I don't need anything. It's okay, it was my pleasure, it's okay, I, I'm just going to go back. It's, I don't really need any type of gift. And the man said, please, Arnold. And he just bugged him and bugged him. Finally, Arnold Palmer said, well, I collect old golf clubs. That would be nice. He flew back to the United States. And about six months later, an envelope arrives. He opens it up, beautiful gilded uh, handwriting and just beautifully gold everything around it and the letter says the following word it says it took it was very difficult to find this but enclosed is the title deed to an old golf club in Scotland he bought the whole club Arnold Palmer was just thinking about the club he bought the whole club it took him a long time because the Scots aren't very happy to get rid of their clubs, all right? Now, I think sometimes with God, when we come to Him, we sometimes just come with such, you know, what, what we think is big is nothing to Him. Why don't you ask Him for the whole club? Not just the club, all right? We need to be gutsy for God. I learned a lot about this from Reinhard Bonker when we were with him. And I remember him telling us about how he built this tent to see 10,000 people. And, and this, he put up this, this tent. He used to travel around and do these crusades and people would come and get saved. And 
At the end of this, um, you know, this crusade, in fact, he had just maybe one last meeting left to go. He was sleeping in the afternoon, and his people woke him up and said, Right now, there's a huge storm coming. It's going to destroy the tent. Reinhardt ran outside, and there was this massive, massive wind, and just, I mean, you could see like a, like a hurricane coming out of the east. And they were all trying to put the tent down and do whatever and try and just save whatever was left because these, these, these storms, they just decimate the tent. But Reinhardt ran, and he stood between the tent and the storm. And he spoke to that storm. He spoke to the devil. And he said, devil, if you destroy my tent, I'm going to build one three times as big. Come on. Yep. Yep. The storm stopped, yep. Yep. and it turned around, and it went the other way. <laughs> and then Reinhardt said, devil, I don't make any deals with you. I'm still going to build one three times as big. And he built one that seated 36,000 people. We need to be gutsy against the devil. But then we need to be gutsy before God. At the same gathering we were with, there was the headmaster from the school I went to in South Africa. It was a very wealthy boarding school. And this school, you don't go there unless you have, I don't know, very wealthy family or, or especially in this day. I mean, it's $100,000 to go through that school. And a little African kid had grown up in the very uh, mining town in the, what is called the Orange Free State in South Africa. His father was killed in a mining accident. His mother left him to go and work in the city, sending money back to him. Until he was nine years old, he was raised by his grandparents. And this little kid, finally when he was nine, his grandparents said, look, we're getting old, we, we, can't, do, we can't take this anymore. You need to go to your mother. And they sent him to the mother in the city. And she had a little tiny apartment. And she couldn't afford to send him even to a primary school. He was nine years old. Well, the mother took out an ad in the newspaper saying, will anybody scholarship my child? And miraculously, somebody said, we'll take that kid. And they put him through his preparatory school, his elementary school. And he started hearing as he was going through the school that people were going to these great schools. And he, and, and he set his heart and said, I'm going to go to the best school in the country. I'm going to go to that school. It's called Hilton. Hilton College. He said to his mother, he called up, and he said, I want to book an appointment with the headmaster, and I'm going to go and interview to get into that school. Well, they didn't have a car. They didn't have any type of transportation. He had to have his mother get a taxi cab. It was one of those buses. It's not a taxi like we think of a taxi. These buses where they take 12 people, but they put 23 in them. And they went down to the local nearest city, and then he got an uncle to drive him to the car that barely made it into the school. Headmaster saw this, this car putting up to the side. This little boy came out. He was about 11 brought his mother into the headmaster's office, sat her down. His clothes were two sizes too small for him because they didn't have money to buy as he was growing. And he introduced his mother and said to the headmaster, he said, this is my mother. She's the most wonderful mother in the whole world. I just want you to, to meet her because she is a wonderful human being and a wonderful person. And he said, now I need to tell you why I'm here. I want to go to the school. I want to become an architect. I want to, and he began to lay out his vision, and the headmaster said, who is your role model? He said, Jesus is my role model. Amen. And he was so gutsy. And the headmaster said, well, how are you going to get money? He says, well, I'm entering a competition on, on uh, um, you know, it's a reading competition. I'm reading every single book. It was a Charles Dickens uh, 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 type of, uh, some book, some major author. And he had read every one of the books that this man had written. And he, there was a competition. He was going to earn money. But he, whatever he was, he was setting his faith. He was believing. He was asking. He left that place and the headmaster just was shocked. He wrote a little newsletter the next day. He sent it out to all of the, all the people in, 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 in the community. And in two days, somebody came forward and said, we will pay that, person, that kid's entire scholarship for him to go to that school. Amen? 
But you know, I was challenged. I thought, here's a kid who has nothing and is willing to, to go right to the headmaster of a top school with no money, no nothing in his bank account, and he's there and he's there and he's asking, how much more can we come before the throne of grace? How much more can we ask for a miracle? How much more can we ask God to do something in our lives? Amen? Well, we're closing up here. We're going to pray together for God to do miracles here tonight. And I want us all just to stand in the presence of God. I want you to come expecting. I want you to believe God to do something here tonight in your life. God brought you here for a purpose. God brought you for a reason tonight. You're the hungry ones. You're the ones who gave up Sunday night football. You're the ones who gave up a lot of other things because you decided that it was more important for you to be in the house of God, for you to be in the atmosphere of the God's presence, for God to move in our midst. And I just felt tonight that God's going to heal somebody here tonight from breast cancer. I don't know. It may be more than one. I want you to, to put your faith into action and believe God to do something like that tonight. And to touch you and heal you because His presence is here. You see, the miracle gets incubated in your spirit. But before, before we pray for a miracle, I want to pray for the greatest miracle. I want to ask that make sure that everybody's okay here tonight. That you, if you're not right with God and you know it tonight, I want to pray for you. Before we believe God for a miracle, I want to pray for the greatest miracle. I want you to be forgiven of your sins and what Jesus did on that cross to be applied to your life that you have salvation, eternal life. You can know tonight that you will make heaven if you were to die. You can know without a, without a doubt, with total surety, Tonight, God can manifest that. There's some of you tonight that need to get saved. I asked Pastor Dan to send me this testimony. I can't get away from it. If it's somebody who came in, and I know that some of you have heard this, but it's important that you hear it again. Because a gang member came into this church, had an opportunity to accept Jesus, had an opportunity to give his heart and get saved. And this is what he wrote to the church. Dear Rock, my name is Justin. I once went to your church. I sat in the back rows with the woman I loved. And she begged me to go up and get saved. I didn't. I felt it wasn't right at the time. And a week later, I ended up killing somebody. And I got into a shootout with the police. Her biggest fear was that I would go to hell since I didn't get saved. I regret not getting saved that day. I regret being worried about what others would think of me walking down there in front of them. But now all I can think of is how life would have been different had I gotten saved, had I listened to the call and to the Lord and to the woman I loved. Now I'm in prisons, in a prison cell doing life. But I'll never forget your church and the day I turned down God. Now I am saved. I dropped out of my gang and I live to make others see what is right. By living right, please pray for me. Just sometimes it's life or death. Your salvation is no small matter to God. And if you've come here tonight and you know you need to get right, if you were to die tonight, would you open up your eyes in heaven or would you open up your eyes in hell? If you're not sure, if you think that by being good or by coming to church you would open up your eyes in heaven, you're wrong. The Bible does not say that. It says only by giving all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ, accepting what He did on that cross that I described to you earlier, only by fully embracing that can you receive life from Jesus Christ and forgiveness for your sins. And tonight you can be saved and tonight you can know that you would make heaven if anything were to happen to you. I'm asking you just to bow your head just for a moment. I'm going to ask, is anybody here that you need to give your life to Jesus Christ tonight? Just raise up your hand if you need to make that decision. I see your hand there, two there. I see there, three there. Anywhere else? I see four, five. Anybody else? I see another hand at the back there. Anybody else that needs to do that? I want you people just 
without nobody clapping, just, just step out into the aisle. I want to pray for you up front. In fact, we're going to pray first. We're going to lead you in salvation. Just step out of the aisle. And just come and meet me up front here. There's a number of you. Just, if you could just step out. Do not be like that guy. Do not make that same mistake. Just come forward. We're going to pray for salvation first, and then we're going to believe God for a miracle together. Anybody else? Just come forward. The people who raised their hands and those who didn't, that you know you need to get saved tonight, please don't turn on the Holy Spirit. Please don't turn on God. He brought you here tonight because He loves you, and He wants to forgive you, and He wants to apply His blood to your heart. He wants to wash every sin that you've ever done away. Anybody else? Just come down and accept Jesus. We're going to pray it all together, and then we're going to stand. While you stand here tonight, we're going to believe for everybody for a miracle. Is there anybody else that needs to join them? Greatest decision you ever made in your life. Anybody else? Thank you. Keep coming up. Anybody else needs to join them? Just come forward. God bless you. It's the best thing you've ever done. We're going to pray all together, everybody together. This is the greatest miracle. All right? This is no other greater miracle than the salvation of a heart. An eternal life that's going to live forever in heaven because of Jesus. I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. I'm going to give you the words, but you pray this to Jesus. Pray it from your heart. He loves you. He will touch you. He's the one who saves. I don't do the saving. I'm just a messenger. Uh, all of us together, join those in front as we pray this prayer. Say, Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. Everybody together again. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. I thank you that you love me. Thank you for dying on that cross. Thank you for going through humiliation. Thank you for your suffering. Thank you for your pain. Thank you for dying for me. For my sins. For my salvation. I believe that you are the Son of God. That you rose from the dead. You're alive right now. And you're here in this place. I ask you, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I give all of my heart and all of my life to you from this day forward. Be my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. God bless you. Best decision you ever made. Right, well, I'm just going to keep you up here while we're going to all pray together. I want you all now to expect. Are you with me, church? I want you to believe God for a miracle. I'm going to speak about a woman by the name of Hannah in the Old Testament who didn't have a baby. She hadn't had a baby for many, many, many years. She came into the temple and she was weeping before, just like people who come into the church here. And she was crying out to God. She was crying from her heart, believing God to do a miracle. And the Bible says that the priest said to her, go your way and may God grant your request. The Bible says she left and she was not sad anymore. Because you see, the miracle happened. See, the miracle happens when you expect it and believe it and receive it. You may receive it in seed form. And it may take time for it to fully manifest. But there will be miracles that of healing that will manifest right now, tonight. There will, be, there will be, I believe, that word of knowledge that I had about a person being healed of breast cancer. I believe God is going to manifest many other miracles of that nature. I want you to put your faith, and I don't want you to ask small things from God. I want you to ask God, what are you believing Him for? Where is your faith at? I want you just to raise up your hands before God. In the presence of God, God's atmosphere is here. Lord, I thank you. You are the miracle working God. Thank you for your anointing, for your power. Thank you, God, that I proclaimed your word tonight. And Lord, your, uh, your presence is in the atmosphere. In the name of Jesus, we stand against the demonic. We stand against every wicked and evil and demonic power that is trying to... Uh, impact and affect the lives of your people in the name of Jesus we break your power every demonic power go I loose you from this grip I command you demon powers go now in the name of Jesus flee and do not return in the name of Jesus Christ 
And Father, we ask you not for small things. I ask you for miracles to manifest in your people tonight. I ask you for your anointing, your power. God, do what only you can do. In the name of Jesus, receive your miracle now. I want you to articulate it to God. I want you to ask Him for it. I want you to believe Him for it. In the name of Jesus, Lord, let your power flow. In the name of Jesus, those who are sick be healed. In the name of Jesus, let the power of God flow into your body. In the name of Jesus, receive healing now. Receive it now. In the name of Jesus, let the power of God touch you. Receive it. I curse you, cancer, in the name of Jesus. I command you to go. I curse you at the root in the name of Jesus. Go from God's people. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I speak to heart disease. In the name of Jesus, be healed right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, let your power just touch your people. Let your presence touch them. I speak to emotional trauma. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Lord, let the power of, of emotional healing flow through your people. Heal the hearts of your people. Heal the broken hearts tonight in the name of Jesus. May God's healing power touch your hearts. Receive it now. Receive it now. How many of you can feel the presence of God in this place tonight? In the atmosphere of heaven. Receive it now. In Jesus' name. Where's Pastor Dave? We have a, on my right over here is Pastor Dave. He's going to, we've already prayed. How many of you feel the presence of God inside your heart? How many of you feel peace and love? Amen. He's just going to do two other things. He's going to give you some literature, some free literature. And he's going to also introduce you to the SPT program. It's a five-week program. And if you give a year of your life to saying, God, I want you to change me. And give a year of your life to what God has at this church. Your life will never be the same again. So if you can just make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave and just give them a hand as they go. God bless you. How many of you received something tonight?